And our second presenter is Yars Balan. And of course, everybody knows Yars, I believe, or at least most of us. Uh, Yars is an administrative coordinator of a Pit and Dory School Ukrainian Canadian Studies Center at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, he has offered numerous uh, scholarly and popular articles on Ukrainian-Canadian history, literature and theater, and an illustrated history of Ukrainians in Canada. A lifelong activist in the Ukrainian community, he is initiator and curator of the Kalina Country Eco Museum. And overall, he is a walking encyclopedia of everything related to Ukrainian Canadian culture. And today, Yars will introduce us to Ukrainian study. And I specifically asked him to tell us uh, for those who uh, never done it before where to start. So, this is an introduc introduction to Ukrainian Canadian culture. Yars, please. Thank you, Yelena, and thank everyone for uh, joining today for the session. Uh, my topic is the study of Ukraine, well, studying Ukrainian communities in Canada, where to start. And so I'm going to um, uh, share some, uh, based on my own personal research in the area, uh, I hope to sketch out uh, some ideas about where to proceed or how to proceed if you're interested in researching a Ukrainian Canadian topic. Uh, next slide. The first thing you have to ask yourself is, um, you know, you have to define your study area and what it is you're trying to accomplish with your research. What motivated you to study Ukrainian communities in Canada? What do you want to learn? Uh, many people start with their family history. They're interested in geneal genealogy or pers they have personal reasons for what they're looking for. Local history might be another uh, source, uh, contextual things, you know, the family came from a certain area or you know they found they settled in a certain area and you want to know more about it you might be uh, somebody who's interested in political history or organizational history that's a whole other area of interest artistic cultural life that's a special area of, of interest religious spiritual life or you might be interested in the contemporary ukrainian community the point is is that your entry point is going to determine what you um what you want to determine Hang on, let me, I just, I'm, I'm in, I'm in your view. I want to get into my view, standard, exit full screen there. Um, what you want, what you're interested in is going to determine uh, where you start and what resources you use. Next, uh, next slide, please. Now, it's obvious to ask, like, why Ukraine? Why study Ukrainians in Canada? I think it's just a fabulous topic. First of all, the size of the Ukrainian community. You have to remember that uh, Ukrainians have immigrated to Canada in four major waves. Uh, the first wave brought 170,000 ethnic Ukrainians to Canada. The second wave in the interwar period uh, was 68,000. The third wave was 53,000. That was in the post Second World War period, the refugee uh, immigration. But since Ukrainian independence, another 60,000 Ukrainians or more have come to have immigrated to Canada. So the community is, is large and is growing. It has a long and layered history in Canada. We're celebrating our 130th anniversary of the first immigrants arriving. It is geographically dispersed, dispersed, and uh, yet there are regional concentrations, especially on the, on the uh, prairies, though these concentrations are changing, shrinking as people move from the farms into the cities. It has a varied ethnographic makeup. By that, I mean people have come from different regions of Ukraine, and they bring with them different tr traditions, different styles of, you know, different cultural features. Uh, this is all going into the mix of Ukrainian-Canadian culture and society. It's a dynamic and an evolving culture. Ukrainian com Ukrainians have been highly organized for a long time and have been around for a long time in Canada. And so that makes it an interesting subject, uh, to you know, them an interesting subject to, st uh, to study. It has a highly developed organizational infrastructure and it has educational and scholarly institutions and support networks for people who are doing research. All of this, I think, combined to make uh, 
the study of Ukrainians in Canada, both fascinating and richly rewarding. And I should add that it's also broadening out because, uh, I mean, there are now 1.3 million Canadians as to the last sentence, uh, census that uh, claimed some sort of Ukrainian ancestry. Um, that doesn't include, and many of these are partial Ukrainian now, one third, one quarter, whatever, uh, through intermarriage, uh, but they still identify in some way with their Ukrainian heritage. Uh, what's also interesting though, is, is that Ukraine has provided a lot more immigrants besides the ethnic Ukrainian immigrants, many Jews, many Poles, many um, Mennonites, uh, German Lutherans, Moravians, uh, uh, Romanians, also come from villages and towns and cities inside Ukraine. And many of these people are now starting to identify their roots as Ukrainian. They say that, you know, they identify with their Ukrainian roots, whereas earlier they said, well, they came from Russia, they came from Poland, they came from Austro-Hungary, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, this is also adding to the mix of uh, Ukrainian Canadian studies. Next slide, please. Okay, so where do you start if you want to learn something about Ukrainians in Canada? Right now, first and foremost, you got to start on the internet. That's the easiest way to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. Uh, there are catalogs, there are uh, digitized resources, uh, databases that can be mined. Uh, so once you've got uh, your, in your mind what you want to look for, I would start with the internet. And it's clear that the internet be is becoming more and more and more important as a source of information as more material gets digitized and put on the internet and made accessible widely. So uh, something else to remember is that it's always worth going back to the internet because the internet is there always, it's always being added to. I'm always amazed when I do research and I put in my search term and I get a whole bunch of hits and I thought, oh great, I forgot this, da, da, da. And you go back three months later and you'll find several new things. Some of it is stimulated by your own activity in searching for it, I guess, the algorithms, the way they work, they realize that uh, this might be of interest and they throw things up. So uh, it's, it's a source you start with and you come back to, and it is gonna become more and more important. Secondly, libraries. Libraries still play an important role in any kind of research, especially for Ukrainian uh, Canadian studies. And there are many good collections at the University of Alberta has a very good collection of Ukrainian Canadian materials. Uh, most universities in Western Canada, Saskatoon, uh, Winnipeg, uh, Toronto has a very good uh, Ukrainian collection with Ukrainian Canadian materials. Uh, and there really is, you have to make use of books and microfilms that haven't been digitized. Now, again, there are more and more of these things that are becoming digitized. For instance, there is a university in Zaporizhia that is gradually scanning and, and digitizing all kinds of Ukrainian Canadian publications, uh, books published in Canada, pamphlets, uh, plays, those kinds of things. Uh, and this is very, very convenient, uh, especially if you're moving somewhere and you don't want to haul your whole library with you to continue working in your new location. You can access more and more information on the internet. If you're going to be going more seriously into research, archives, because you want primary sources become very important. And I would like to just point out that first of all, the search in archives begins in your own personal family archives. Many families have, you know, collections of things that they've saved documenting their own histories and that these can be very, very valuable to you in your work, depending on what you're doing. There are community archives. Oseradok in Winnipeg, the Ukrainian Cultural and Education Center is one that's very well known. We regrettably just lost our Ukrainian Canadian Archives and Museum of Alberta, but there are museums here as well uh, that have materials. Um, there are university and provincial archives. Our U University of Alberta archive has Ukrainian Canadian materials. The provincial archives of Alberta is a good place, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, Ontario, because I made use of them and they've got uh, interesting materials on Ukrainians in Canada. And then of course, there's the granddaddy of them all, the, uh, Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa, which has uh, fairly extensive Ukrainian collections assembled over the years. Uh, but that again is a little for more in-depth research uh, uh, generally than uh, you know somebody just interested in a general way. I would suggest that uh, for family history, if that's your focus, you start by conducting interviews with your senior family members to obtain leads, context, details, 
to mine that source first, that's closest to you before you go off looking for things in, uh, in, coll in ar archival collections or on the internet even. Uh, museums, art galleries have resources that can be accessed and there's specialized holding, holdings as well. Uh, the National Film Board, for instance, has digitized all their films and many of them are on Ukrainian Canadian themes dating back 30, 40 years, 50 years ago uh, and can be accessed now uh, online as well. So uh, you got to be you got to be curious, you've got to be adventurous because it is an adventure doing research. You have to be patient, you have to be creative, uh, and you have to um, be determined. You also have to be prepared to make serendipitous discoveries. I mean, this in the old days when you would go up to the stacks in the library and you'd be looking on the shelves for a book and um, you would, um, uh, as you're there, you look, you know, one shelf over and it's like, oh, look at this. I don't even know about this book. I mean, you're, you stumble on things. And it's the same thing with the internet. And that's always wonderful to make these serendipitous uh, discoveries. Uh, you got to be flexible uh, when you do, especially digital searches. It's not enough to put in Ukrainian or, or, or Bukovinian because you got to spell it Ukrainian because very often they, could, they leave out the I. Uh, Bukovinian spelled with a V or with a W or, you know, Bukovinian. There are all kinds of misspellings, even with names and everything like that. So uh, you have to remember to be flexible in your approach. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Now, you're very fortunate that, uh, oh, and I should, one other thing I would add, thank God we're not Poles. Because uh, if you were to put as your search term on the, uh, in a digital database, uh, Pol Polish, you'll get every shoe polish ad and tooth polish ad and whatever. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, Ukrainian doesn't uh, uh, have, have synonyms that uh, draw you, draw you in, in blind alleys here. And we're very fortunate that the Ukrainian community in Canada has produced a, an extensive written and published record. Some things you need to be uh, aware of. So first of all, is that there's a lot of stuff that is written and, and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you can find it already documented, written up, then you don't need to uh, uh, you know, re reinvent the wheel on it. The quality of the list, this literature varies widely but it is useful and it is an interesting place to start. And sometimes I said, you got to sort of comb through it. Some of the stuff isn't that factually accurate, uh, especially stuff in the local histories, uh, but uh, there are some gems sort of scattered among it. So again, you have to go through materials looking for stuff uh, that's relevant to, to your, your interests, your research interests. Some of the published materials of a scholarly nature, some of it is they're popularly written works, but they are they're intended more for the general reader, but they might be sufficient for your purposes. So uh, the fact that, that something doesn't have footnotes all through it uh, may be fine for what you're doing. There are political factors that have to be taken into account uh, when doing Ukrainian Canadian research. Uh, because of the political division in the community, but first of all, between the communists and then the pro-Soviet and the uh, anti-communist wing of the community, but also between the different organizations and organizational rivalries, this uh, colors the research and the, and the materials that are, are available. So for instance, you'll get an account on uh, the, Ukra uh, the Ukrainian stage in Canada by Peter Krauchuk. And it's really the history of the Ukrainian stage of the Ukrainian Labor Farm Temple Association, the Association of United Ukrainian Canadians. It's not a general history of Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian theater. Uh, the, from the quote unquote national side of the community, there's the same issues. So you should be aware of that, that sometimes you need to uh, read in several areas to get a balanced picture of, of something. There are many um, articles not just published in books, but they're scattered in journals and periodicals and essay collections. Uh, sometimes the title of the collection won't tell you that you know it'll be to look for, but uh, be aware that there, there are materials available in all kinds of nooks and crannies. And most important of all, there are gaps in this literature that uh, are still waiting to be filled, and maybe that's your job as researchers. Uh, the pioneer era, for example, is much better documented uh, than the interwar years. Uh, 
uh, for various reasons. It was a much bigger dem immigration. There's a kind of mystique around, you know, the trailblazing pioneers. The, uh, there was a certain kind of romance to it, I guess. And so it's been the focus of greater scholarly attention as well. Uh, but that just means that there's all kinds of opportunities to do new research in areas that need to be explored. And uh, next uh, slide, please. Now, there are a variety of sources that um, are of use to people doing Ukrainian-Canadian studies. One, one obvious one are commemorative books. So uh, you have uh, organizations that publish these big volumes very often, like the uh, history of the Narodny Dim or the National Home in Winnipeg, or the one here in, in Edmonton, uh, that are just stuffed with information. Uh, they're very, very useful. There are church parishes and churches that have published uh, commemorative books, very often on anniversary dates, uh, 50th, 30th, you know, whatever anniversary. Uh, but there are also even fam familial compilations. Uh, so, you know, publications that come out on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the settlement of a, a particular family, and they go to the effort and they compile a commemorative book for all the members of their family. These may not end up in libraries. You may need to find them through people who happen to be a member of that family. Some of them do end up in, in uh, the uh, Cool Folklore Center, for instance, in their collection of things, uh, but that they can be useful. Almanacs, these aren't such, these are almost not existent anymore, uh, but for a long time, they were uh, very popular and every newspaper organization uh, published uh, almanacs. And the almanacs are really compendiums of things. So they had calendars, church calendars, and in, in, the, in the case of the uh, uh, people from the church communities, but they also included articles on subjects that are of interest in, in Ukrainian Canadian studies. So um, this is uh, uh, something to, you know, they're, they're, they're fascinating reading. I, you know, I particularly enjoy going through almanacs for the different years. Local histories. Many communities in Western Canada uh, have published uh, local histories. And these can be especially valuable for genealogical research because often they have a whole section devoted to families who settled the area and they get them, them to write up their little family histories. Uh, again, the quality of these really varies. Some of the family histories are a little bit wonky. Uh, some of them are, are better than others, but uh, they're useful. And also the institutional history. So they'll have a section on the churches in the community. So you can look up the Ukrainian churches or on businesses, uh, things like that. So um, they're a valuable source uh, of information on uh, Ukrainians uh, in Canada. Conference proceedings. Uh, the various organizations, you know, have, hold annual conferences or bi biannual or triannual conferences, like in the case of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, the Ukrainian Labor Farm Temple Association, for instance, uh, has uh, you know, some of the early conferences are fascinating. They're full of detail of debates, discussions, presentations, and everything, financial uh, information about the organization, that kind of stuff. Uh, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, all of their congresses uh, are documented. And again, you know, resolutions that get passed and uh, programs and these kinds of things. So, uh, especially for anybody doing organizational history, uh, they can be uh, very useful. There are, of course, as well, the academic conferences, the scholarly conferences devoted to particular subjects, whether it was the 100th anniversary of uh, Ukrainian settlement in Canada, which uh, CIUS sponsored a big uh, conference on, and the papers from that conference get to get you know put together in uh, conference proceedings. Travelogues. I love this stuff. This is really good. Uh, starting with Joseph Olescu, the uh, Ukrainian agronomist who uh, came to Canada at the invitation of the Canadian government and traveled across the country to familiarize himself with what kind of uh, job opportunities would be available for immigrants, what the land uh, quality of the land was, etc., things like that. And of course, he documented all of this in uh, two collections, two books uh, that were published, and they're fascinating reading. I mean, uh, Olescu, for instance, was the first Ukrainian tourist in Banff. Uh, 
uh, and he devotes a little, little uh, discussion to that. But he, was a, he managed to make it all the way to the west coast of Vancouver Island. And um, uh, it was published, he was here in 1895. So this is very early on. Nestor Dmitri was another one. Um, he uh, wrote uh, a series of articles that were then collected and published as a book called Kanadiska Rus. And in 1897, on the invitation again of the Canadian government, thanks to the groundbreaking work done by Joseph Olescu, who recommended him, he then traveled and visited all the early colonies that were established by Ukrainians in, in Western Canada. And they're, and, and they're great because they describe both what it was like traveling in those days, you know, taking the train. And I mean, there's a fascinating account here when he was in Edmonton and was uh, leaving, uh, uh, leaving the city and uh, talks about, you know, there was a Chinese family and there was a Japanese couple that were traveling with him on the train and um, the difference between the two, the, the, he talks about the fact you get fresh strawberries and this was like in May. Uh, and so where do you get fresh strawberries? Because it was imported, I guess, from California uh, in those days uh, that uh, the uh, railway companies order, ordered. Uh, the, the atmosphere on the train, uh, he was a big fan of, uh, he was a big Anglophile, I guess, is what you'd say. He, he liked Americans, he liked uh, North Americans, he liked American women uh, and everything. So all of that comes through, but the details are very, very rich in details. Like when he goes out to uh, Fort Saskatchewan and he takes a, he goes out by wagon, a uh, young man took him out and they spent the night in Fort Saskatchewan and he describes the trip on the trail. So all of that is like very, very interesting. Those are some of the early ones, but, there are later ones that come along too. So Osip Nazaruk in 1920s, uh, he traveled across Canada and uh, wrote up his experiences and they were published in, in long articles, uh, descriptions of what he saw. Doki Humanna, Vichni Ohni Albert, Michael Marichak wrote about traveling in, to Alberta and describing people that he met and places that he was. All of this stuff is fascinating and very valuable. And it goes to the it goes on and on. I mean, the most recently Stanislaw Lozebnik and uh, earlier, uh, I think it was Volodymyr Brovchenko. Uh, I think uh, uh, the late uh, poet, um, anyway, you know, the, uh, people from Soviet Ukraine who came uh, or post <laughs> independence Ukraine who came and who traveled around Ooh. Canada and end up writing a travel log. So this is a whole genre of, of uh, work that is very, very interesting and useful for some kinds of research in, in Ukrainians in Canada. There are, of course, uh, theses and dissertations that have been written on topics related to Ukrainians in Canada. Uh, many of these or most of these are now available online and can be very, again, the quality varies. I mean, some of the MA theses are a little bit thin. Some of the, some of the material is dated. Uh, but there, there is a fairly extensive body of work uh, that's worth exploring as well. Directories. They can be kind of mundane. You think, well, you know, telephone directory, business directory, association membership directory. I'll give you one example of how directories got used. When Oris Martinovich was uh, writing his first volume on uh, the history of Ukrainians in Canada in the pioneer era, he got a, I believe it was a 1911 copy of a telephone directory for Winnipeg. And he went through and first of all, flagged all the Ukrainians so who could afford a phone and this is still early days. So who, who in the community had a phone? And of course, many of the leading activists all had phones. And many of these activists were engaging in fierce polemics in the press. They were attacking each other and calling each other horrible names and whatever, they were at war. And he said, the shocking revelation was, is that of course they gave the address. And he says, when you start to look at the address and you realize they were living three doors down from each other, uh, how they uh, interacted on the sidewalks must've been pretty interesting. But uh, directories there, you know, those things can be useful. Now there are mainstream Canadian newspapers and magazines that are also full of material of Ukrainian Canadian interest. Um, McLean's magazine has now been digitized and is publicly accessible. Saturday Night Magazine, uh, not so, but it, there's material there, uh, Canadian Forum. Um, many Canadian newspapers have now been uh, digitized. 
and so they could they're available as searchable databases and i i've been making extensive use of these in recent years um again the, it varies in quality the edmonton journal for some reason i mean the the paper was cheap the printing quality wasn't the best and on top of that the editing wasn't the best either uh, and so it's hard to make out some of them but you can cover a lot of ground uh, i was just working on a piece on michael govda and I put it in in the Edmonton Journal and got 300 hits. Well, of course, not all of them are about the Michael Golda that I was interested in, but there were lots and a lot of interesting stuff. And you, from 1906, from 1928, from 1942, uh, you cover a lot of ground with them. But uh, uh, this is a very rich source. And if you're working with English language sources, if you don't speak Ukrainian, you can access this material and make extensive use of it. You'll find all kinds of interesting stuff there. And of course, there are the guides. Uh, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies produced a guide, uh, Francis Swiddy put his guide to Ukrainian Canadian newspapers, periodicals, and calendar almanacs. There are other guides that are available online. And all of these are very, very useful sources for pursuing research into uh, the history of Ukrainians in Canada. Now, there are, uh, in the literature on Ukrainians in Canada, uh, there's some well-known names that uh, deserve to be recognized and, and can be very useful. There goes, these include James uh, Wordsworth, J.S. Wordsworth, whose uh, 1909 study, uh, Strangers Within Our Gates, Coming Canadians, is a classic and deals a lot with the Ukrainians. My Neighbor, a Study of City Conditions as a Plea for Social Services. You'll see there's no Ukrainian in the title, but the subject of his studies you know, do document a lot of stuff about Ukrainians in that period. The first work of Ukrainian Canadian history uh, really has to be credited to Sigmund Baczynski, who in 1928 published a book called Historia Kanade. It's only available in, in Ukrainian. And um, in it, he gave a history of Canada. It was introduced by Ralph Connor or the uh, Charles, Reverend Charles uh, G.D. Gordon, better known as Ralph Connor. He wrote an introduction to it. But he also included a chapter on Ukrainians in Canada. And that became the, that really is the very first work of Ukrainian Canadian history. And it just shows you that the community at a fairly early stage became conscious of the fact that it was making history uh, and that it was needed, you know, needing to be written up. Uh, Bichinsky was also kind of a literary scholar. He was an educated man. He was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, well connected with the Anglo community, he had uh, uh, his his wife published early stories in Maclean's magazine in in the 1920s uh, in English, and um, he himself also wrote a novel Kuchurovyi, which uh, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies published about a decade ago in Ukraine for the very first time. This is a novel that he finished in the mid 30s. And basically, it's a novel that describes the immigrant experience of Ukrainian immigration to Saskatchewan. And um, it's a big book, uh, very richly detailed. He shopped it around and was hoping to get it published uh, in, the, in the 1930s, uh, had no takers. He approached Trident Press and uh, uh, they, weren't, they didn't uh, buy it. And so uh, it sat in manuscript form until his 90 odd year old son contacted our institute and it, it got published. But this is one of the exciting things that happens that there are, there are materials out there that you, we, didn't know, we don't know about and that keep showing up. Um, so uh, uh, Charles Young, the Ukrainian Canadians, a study in assimilation from 1931 is another classic study. Uh, Moving though more into a little more modern era or, or contemporary era as uh, Vladimir K. Kisilovsky, uh, that was his English name, published a series of very, very seminal works, his early Ukrainian settlements in Canada to start with, and then his dictionary of Ukrainian Canadian biography, which has now appeared in three different volumes, one devoted to Alberta, one to Manitoba, one to Manitoba, one to Alberta, and one to Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan was just one was just published in 2018. It's all you know published posthumously. Michael Mudanchak is a big heavyweight because he was a, a Ukrainian immigrant after the Second World War who wrote numerous books and articles on history. I couldn't even begin to list them here. Um, but uh, major, major works. Uh, 
His uh, multi-volume history of Ukrainians in Canada was published in English in a abridged English translation called the Ukrainian Canadians, a big fat book. Uh, and then even though some of it's dated, uh, some of it's not 100% uh, accurate or whatever, it still is a very useful place to start uh, uh, any research because again, he footnoted things and so you, you can follow up on, on sources as well with him. Um, and he also produced a, a biographical Dovidnik or, uh, uh, to the history, his, his book, which is again, extremely useful, very incomplete, lots of names that should be there that aren't but at least in for many cases, give you basic biographies of uh, prominent members of the uh, Ukrainian community. Another person um, who uh, is certainly worth mentioning is Petro Kravchuk. Uh, Kravchuk was an activist in the Ukrainian, Ukrainian Labor Farm Temple Association. He was an interwar era immigrant to Canada, unlike Marunchak, who came after the Second World War. And he took up the task of documenting and writing up the history of Ukraine, Ukrainians in Canada from a left-wing perspective. And he was extremely productive, hardworking, and he produced all kinds of books and articles on all kinds of aspects of Ukrainians in Canada, including the history of the uh, Ukrainian Labor Farm Temple Association, Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, uh, their theatrical history, uh, literary history of Ukrainians in Canada, just on a whole variety of topics. Uh, and uh, with Marun Chak, the two of them are really pivotal figures in the evolution of Ukrainian Canadian studies. Olya Voitsenko. Olya Voitsenko performed an invaluable service because she went through uh, the issues of uh, Ukrinsky Hollis. I can't remember when the last one, what the last one covers, but I think it's in, they're in seven or nine volumes or, or what. But they're um, they're a great source for the, she doc she she flags names and issues or whatever that you can uh, you know sources in the, of articles that appeared in the press uh, very useful thing and then of course you had uh, the former university or the late University of Manitoba professor uh, J B or Yaroslav Rudnitsky he was a specialist in folklore linguistics on uh, whatever it's, it's called, onismatics, whatever, both names, uh, uh, but a very wide ranging intellectual. And uh, he uh, published all kinds of little booklets on various things that are of relevance to um, Ukrainians in Canada. Next slide. There are, so within this general body of literature, there are specialized areas. For me, because of my interest in Ukrainian Canadian literature, I'm most familiar with, with it. And uh, there are several names that stand out in terms of writing and publishing on Ukrainian Canadian literature. Makita Mandreka, who wrote a history of Ukrainian literature in Canada in 1941 yet, was translated and published in 68 into English. Uh, Yar Slobutich, uh, late uh, professor at the University of Alberta, uh, was very active in producing numerous articles and books on literature. He has a bibliography of Ukrainian Canadian writing, far from complete, still useful, uh, and um, you know made a seminal contribution in, in many respects. This is something that has to be given the post World War II immigration has to be given some credit for that they came to Canada and. Um, rather than just poo-pooing uh, the earlier generations of, of uh, immigration, of the pioneer and the interwar immigration, they took an interest in them and they began writing about them and documenting them. Not all, there were, there were members of that uh, post-World War II generation that did kind of look down their noses at them, but these, the, there were scholars, uh, historians, whatever, like Mandreka and, uh, well, like Slavutic and um, Marunchak, uh, that took this stuff seriously and made a contribution to the development of Ukrainian Canadian studies. Alexa Haiholoka was another one. Watson Kirkconnell was a very in an interesting character because he was a multilingual literary person, but who um, uh, was very active and very interested in Ukrainian Canadian literature. Probably learned the learned learned Ukrainian, did translations from Ukrainian, and. Uh, really popularized Ukrainians in uh, Canadian literature. Uh, myself, I've been, my own work sort of falls more into this category. I'm interested in Ukrainian-Canadian literary history. 
and in particular the the history of Ukrainian uh, theater uh, in Canada. And then, of course, there is a wealth of literature by dozens and dozens of authors, poets, playwrights who wrote creative works in Ukrainian, on Ukrainian, Canadian, and other themes. And this is going on. I know that uh, Olya Presich in uh, uh, Victoria uh, is, a, is a writer, and she's been writing uh, um, you know, books and, and things like that. So the, the uh, writers who come from Ukraine and still write in Ukrainian are, have also contributed to this literature. But Canada is unusual that we produced a generation that was born in Canada as well, and also contributed to Ukrainian language literature, that they spoke the language well enough, they felt comfortable. Uh, Ivan Daniluk, uh, Danilchuk is, is one name that comes to mind. Uh, Mikhailo Petrovsky, uh, you know, who were raised in Canada, but uh, chose to write in Ukrainian and made a contribution to Ukrainian literature. So this is a whole sort of like specialized area. I could do the same thing for Ukrainian church history. For instance, the uh, Paul Yuzik's history of Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, there are uh, the history of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church by Semen um, Sauchuk, Reverend Sauchuk and uh, uh, Moluklusik, uh, four volume major sort of study of, of the history, dated now, but uh, still very, uh, very uh, useful. Now, when you want to go del delving deeper into it, now, um, one thing that sometimes gets overlooked by people working in nonfiction is, is that they use only nonfiction sources and they ignore the um, uh, fictional literature. Um, before I get into that, though, I just want to point out that one other area, source of very, very interesting information is the memoiristic literature. It produced both by immigrants in different waves of immigration, some of them pioneers, some of them interwar, uh, some of them post-World War II, and I'm sure hopefully uh, this latest immigration will produce its memoiristic literature, but also in some cases their descendants and there were Canadians who lived and worked among uh, Ukrainians in Canada who also contributed to this literature. This has not been properly explored. There's work to be done in this area. So if that's something that catches your fancy, that's, you might wanna focus on that. I've got a whole couple of shelves of memoirs uh, that I have not read because <laughs> I, I just haven't had time. Uh, some of them I'm familiar with, some of them. Uh, and there are fa fascinating things. Like in the pioneer area, you get these accounts of encounters with the First Nations people in some of these um, uh, memoirs. So uh, lots of interesting stuff there. But let's talk a bit about fictional literature and poetry. It's important because it provides, it can, it can flesh out a, um, a community, a culture. Uh, so, uh, and, and, the, and it describes, gives an end to the emotional reactions of people to Canada. So you have poems, you know, to Banff and whatever to, or to Canada, you know, that uh, express feelings for the for Canada and describe uh, experiences, Canadian, their Canadian experiences, which is very valuable. Um, but um, there's this wealth of literature. So some of it's in English. Uh, Ralph Connor is a good example. Uh, the Foreigner is the very first book of fiction published with, a, with Ukrainian material. So it, it's set in North End, Winnipeg, came out in 1909, created a huge kerfuffle in the community who are not happy with it because he portrayed the Galician ghetto, uh, really, uh, where many of the immigrants are poor, standards of hygiene were low, they were struggling, there were all kinds of social problems, uh, and uh, many Ukrainians were offended by his uh, portrayal of them. He also had vague ideas about who these people were. I mean, they're all sort of Hungarians, Russians. It's all like this morass uh, that he threw together. Uh, but Connor was a hugely popular writer at the time. He published a whole series of novels. Um, I said his, his uh, actual, that was his pet literary pen name. His, his, he was actually Reverend Charles G.D. Gordon who uh, became the first uh, superintendent of the United Church of Canada, uh, Presbyterian minister, missionary priest in Western Canada, uh, 
uh, very interesting character and then by and large sympath quite sympathetic to Ukrainians, but the foreigner was not, uh, as I said, a big hit and unfortunately they also made it into a movie in the 1920s, it must have been a, uh, uh, you know, without sound or whatever, I, I've never seen it, I'd be curious to see it. But more importantly, there were all these other Canadian authors, many of them very well known names that produced literature where they have Ukrainian characters, Ukrainian storylines, uh, Frederick Philip Grove as uh, one, Morley Callahan, W.O. Mitchell, a very famous one who has seen the wind. Gabriel Roy, I just recently read uh, Where Nests the Water Hen and Streets of Riches. Uh, Where Nests the Water Hen takes place northeast of Dauphin. Uh, and uh, even though it's a French, the story of a French family, there are, you, there's all these interactions with the Ukrainians in the area that, that are described and are quite interesting. Uh, and then Street of Riches, she has a story devoted to uh, a settlement of Bukovinians in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, and um, it's, it's actually it's in it's in Manitoba, but it's it's, fic it's fictionalized. But her father was an immigration agent, and she drew on that experience in her account. Sinclair Ross's Sawbones Memorials, another uh, well-known work, and there are a whole slew of other Canadian authors who have uh, integrated Ukrainian stories into their. Uh, fictional work, uh, W.G. Valgard's son, John Marlin, Morley Torgov, Margaret Lawrence, and, uh, and others. So uh, if that's, if fiction is your, is your passion, then there's lots to, to read in English and in Ukrainian as well. Uh, next uh, slide. Now, uh, more authors, you know, began writing, you know, uh, writing on Ukrainian Canadian themes. Um, one famous work is Vera Lysenko's Men in Sheepskin Coats, a study in uh, assimilation, which came out in 1946. This is already, you know, again, Ukrainians taking an interest in their own community and in their own history. And uh, uh, Vera also wrote uh, two novels, which I'll mention a little bit later. But um, uh, this is an important work is kind of using sociological uh, resources and uh, historical resources to create uh, a sense of what the community looked like at that particular moment. Uh, J.S. McGregor's Provini Zamli Freelands, the Ukrainian settlement in Alberta is a famous book. Uh, and it's really about the block settlement Northeast of Edmonton. And uh, again, full of all kinds of anecdote and, and interesting information uh, that make it rewarding uh, reading. Am I on the same page as you? No, I'm not. <laughs> I think you've gone ahead of me. Yes, you've gone. It should be still more authors who have written on, go to the next one. No, oh, how is this? I skipped, I skipped. Uh, I skipped the slide, sorry about that. Um, yes, well, this makes sense because I was talking about fictional works uh, and creative literature. Um, Canadian writers of Ukrainian descent. I said Vera Lesenko wrote two novels, Yellow Boots and Westerly Wild, in addition to her book about uh, um, her study of assimilation. George Riga, probably still the best known Ukrainian Canadian author, uh, author of Hungry Hills, Portrait of Angelica, A Letter to My Son, and other works, screenplays. Um, and uh, in some cases, I mean, Portrait of Angelica is set in Mexico, but it's a Ukrainian couple, snowbirds, and, and their experiences in this Mexican village that are the focus of the, of the play. Uh, Letter to My Son was made into a, uh, was done as a screenplay and published as a, a separate work as well. Um, but it, it, he has other little Ukrainian references throughout other works of his. Myrna Kostash is, is with George, uh, extremely well known, especially her All of Baba's Children, which came out in 1977. It was groundbreaking because it was devoted primarily to describing the first Canadian born generation of Ukrainians in Canada but she followed it up with Bloodlines and A Doomed Bridegroom, a memoir based on her travels in Ukraine and uh, Eastern Europe. 
Helen Petrobanko's book, No Streets of Gold, came out at the same time as Myrna's book did and didn't get the same amount of attention, but it's still very valuable, partly because Helen grew up in the Peace River country and in another area settled by Ukrainians outside the block settlement, whereas Myrna's was focused, uh, her all above his children's was focused in the Two Hills area of Alberta. Janice Kula Kiefer, who I happen to have grown up with in Toronto and have known uh, my whole life, uh, has now produced a, a number of works that deal with uh, Ukrainians, uh, being a Ukrainian Canadian, her Green Library, Honey and Ashes, a family story, and uh, the Ladies Lending Library, which takes place at Kalena Beach in Ontario, which is a fictionalized version of Wasega Beach. Larry Varvaruk from Saskatchewan, his Ukrainian wedding in 1999, Andre and the Snowwalker came out. And there are other authors, Mara Haas, Marusia Butsyurkiu, um, others that I are too numerous to mention here, or whatever, uh, including some self published authors. The Ukrainian community has a real can do spirit, and these people, uh, if they may not get a, a, a mainstream publisher, they just produce it themselves. Next slide. So I started to mention about uh, Vera Lesenko and uh, J.S. McGregor, but more of the people who wrote uh, historical and scholarly works include now a long list of people. Robert Klimash, who is well known, of course, to our folklore friends. Uh, Michael Ivanchuk, the late Michael Ivanchuk, a former teacher who produced a whole string of books on Ukrainians in Manitoba. Fascinating, full of fascinating materials. Ars Martinovich, who's author two histories of Ukrainians in Canada, one on the pioneer period, one on the interwar period. Francis Sviripa, who's written several books about Ukrainians, Jerry Petration, Bohdan Kordan, Ivo Merlitschuk, Oleg Gerus, Tom Spremak, Yaroslav Rozumny, Stella Renyuk, John Lair, and many others. So there is a very extensive body of work that you can draw on, published work that you can now draw on in doing your research. Next. Now, I wanted to uh, sort of wrap up by saying a few things about the uh, Ukrainian-Canadian epistolary tradition, letter writing tradition. First of all, of course, you have the personal letters to and from the homeland. And I would just wanna say that I keep thinking that uh, there are still probably gems to be found out there sitting in a suitcase or in a box, in, a, in an, a suitcase in an attic or a box in an outbuilding on the farm. Uh, with letters and uh, photographs or something like that uh, in a garage. Uh, so we've got to try to let people know not to just toss these because they could be very valuable sources for research purposes. You have, of course, official letters uh, that were sent from government agencies that have been preserved. You have published letters that have been reproduced in books, uh, in collections and in newspaper articles. Um, so this is especially interesting, like I know from the uh, period of the famine, that there are a couple of letters that were translated and published in Canadian daily newspapers that came from Ukraine. Letters to the editor. These are a real great source for a variety of reasons. First of all, the ones in the Ukrainian press are really valuable because they are often described very local conditions. They'll talk about what the weather's like, they'll talk about uh, the harvest, what kind of crops there are, or they'll talk about conflicts, debates, issues in the community. Uh, so they're excellent for local and for uh, organizational history. And of course, there are the, main, the letters to the editor of the mainstream Canadian press, and that's when Ukrainians you know, would get upset about some issue or wanted to draw public attention to an issue and would write letters to the editor. They would be responding to something that was published by the paper, uh, there's a whole separate study that could be done just on letter writing to the letters to the editor. One other place that you don't normally think of as letters, but telegrams. Telegrams, I figure, are just kind of maybe the Twitter of today, of, of earlier times or what, because of course they have to be very short and punchy. But um, they were especially important during the uh, Second World War years, uh, having worked now with a number of personal archives and in them you find these telegrams that you know the war office reporting that your son is missing in action uh, his plane disappeared or whatever and then warning you know, saying uh, that uh, <clears throat> he had been taken prisoner and you know the, they inform you of this and that uh, so they're a, they're an interesting source uh, 
And of course, there's the confiscated letters that are held in um, uh, Soviet archives. But I'm just about done. Next slide. One of the things that struck me about the uh, letter writing is how um, the fact that, that uh, the fact that the postal system had Canada had a postal system that actually worked. I mean, in some ways it was even better. I'm always shocked to see that letters written in Star, Alberta, uh, and mailed in Star Post Office would reach New York in, in 10 days. I mean, I, I think sometimes they would have a hard time even doing that today. And that's, you know, uh, a rural post office that they had to come in by horse and, uh, you know, bring, bring the mail with them. So um, the, uh, the, the, the letter service, the, the postal service was remarkably effective. and can consider the isolation of these, these villages and how they would, those letters would travel first through Canada and then to Ukraine and end up in a village in Ukraine. It really is a, a remarkable feat. Now, not only did these people write letters to family and friends back home, but they also wrote them to church officials, to newspapers, both in North America and Austro-Hungarian Ukraine, effectively documenting uh, their lives, their hopes and activities. And I can just mention as by way of advertisement here that the Canadian City of Ukraine Studies, for instance, has published a collection of letters uh, from Ukrainian immigrants to Canada, to Ukraine, Znovoho Kraju, uh, that was edited and compiled by Oleksandr Sitch, and there are other collections like this, but they're very interesting and they're very useful uh, for the study of Ukrainians in Canada. Next. Now, one of the things that, uh, just in, in concluding, uh, going back to the early immigration to Canada, is the importance of letter writing in bringing people to Canada. Having learned to read and write at a young age, Ilya Kiryak, the well-known author of Sinism Yi, often wrote letters for illiterate neighbors and other villagers to family members who had settled abroad, also reading the letters that they sent in reply from distant homesteads on the prairies. In his own words, quote, those acres, bushels of grain, and herds of cattle seduced me. Inspired by these accounts, when an opportunity to emigrate to Canada presented itself to Kiryak, he was quick to seize on it, and he left his native village in Zavalya for Canada in the middle of a snowstorm in 1906. So these letters fired the imaginations of the peasants, the relatives who had stayed, neighbors and friends and neighbors, family and neighbor who had stayed behind in Canada and encouraged many of them to write. And they yanked a lot of these people. And of course, when they came to Canada, they looked for land as close as possible to their relatives. And so you develop these recreated villages in some ways uh, in the patterns of settlement of uh, where people were clustered together who knew each other in the old country or were close to each other in the old country and uh, continue that relationship here. But it was the letters that were the hook that brought him, brought him here. And I thought that's an interesting thought uh, considering this letters project. And the final slide. Here's a, another well-known uh, Ukrainian Canadian author, Miroslav Yerchan, who came to Canada in 1923, uh, sadly, unfortunately, decided to go back to Soviet Ukraine in 1929. He was brought to Canada on the invitation of the Ukrainian Labor Farm Temple Association to be an organizer and agitator. Um, he was left wing and uh, uh, he wanted to be part of the revolutionary society that was being created in Ukraine uh, and uh, went back uh, because he felt his horizons were limited in Canada. And he went back to Soviet Ukraine and uh, instead got himself arrested uh, in 1932, uh, 32, 33 it was, I guess, uh, sent to the Gulag and uh, died, uh, it was executed in 1936. But he writes that in his memoirs, or he writes in some of his things that as a child growing up in the village of Piadiki in Western Ukraine, which is near Kolomea, uh, he heard many stories about the hard life of immigrants in the new world. On long winter nights, fellow villagers would gather in his family homes family home to share their troubles and pass the hours telling stories. Sometimes they also read letters from friends and relatives who had migrated abroad, many of them to homesteads on the Canadian prairies. These reports from faraway places often encouraged people to immigrate and inspired young Yerchan to write an early poem that read, oh, don't go to Manitoba, in Manitoba things are bad. Whoever goes there will write that poverty is hounding him. <laughs>
anybody who was literate, and especially the younger people who had an opportunity to go to school, were often pressed into service to write letters for people or to read letters when they came. And this is uh, uh, also picked up in another uh, work by uh, Irchan, a novel called Karpatska Nietzsche, which describes the immigrant, uh, the immigration of a um, young Ukrainian from uh, the Carpathian region of Ukraine to the United States. Uh, he's illiterate and he works in laboring jobs. He works in uh, the forestry industry and in mining and uh, in a steel mill. Uh, and in the meantime, he's periodically writing letters home to his wife and children who are wondering, of course, what's happening to him. But because he couldn't read or write, he would get people to do that. And very often he was living in boarding houses with other Ukraine other Slavs, not even necessarily Ukrainians. He gets some Croatian guy would write in what he thought was, you know, he would dictate or whatever. And, uh, but some of these guys would charge money for this, to writing the letter and uh, never, never mailed it, never delivered it for him. And so the wife sat there wondering, is he alive? Is he dead? And eventually she remarried. It's a very tragic story and everything like that. But I thought that was a kind of an interesting uh, sidebar sort of story on letter writing and uh, the challenges that it posed. But I think I'll leave my uh, comments at that and uh, entertain any questions that you might have.